We're now looking at how do we, what options do we have to get our bits from our transmitter to our receiver. So the different media that we can send our signals via. The one op option is the, our LAN cables, for example. This is the example of the transmission media. We n need to, what we're going to do in this topic is compare some common transmission media. Not all of them, we won't look at, into detail of many of them, but we'll just compare several of the common ones to give you an example of different transmission media. The thing between the transmitter and receiver. So as people come in, find a seat. There's enough seats for everyone. There's enough seats for everyone, which means sit down in one. Of course, we can have, and we'll go through today the different types. We can have guided media, cables, wires, and we can have unguided media, wireless transmission. So transmitting from my laptop at, at, up to the wireless access point is an example of using unguided media. We'll go through the two, two different types. So find a seat. There are plenty of seats at the front. Today we'll look at guided media, go through three examples and maybe start a little bit about wireless transmission, unguided media. But first, your goal when you need to design a network or build a network, you need to select the media to use. Okay? So one thing that we care about, or the, the key concerns from your perspective is normally things like data rate and distance. That is data rate, how fast can we send our data through a particular transmission media? We normally want to maximize that to support our applications and to support our many users. And often the other factor we care about is distance. If we choose some transmission media, we'd like to be able to send across a large distance. If I choose a transmission media to connect all of our computers in this campus together, it's not going to be very good if the media I choose can only transmit signals across one meter. Because what I would need to do is have okay, a cable that goes for one meter, and then we need some amplifier or repeating device to send again. So the length at which the cables can carry the signals is important. Normally we want to be able to send our signals as far as possible. We know when we send signals that they attenuate, they get weaker. We transmit at the transmitting device, the signal strength gets weaker across distance. We will see in this topic some equations that relate the distance and the signal strength uh, shortly. So we would like a media that allows to send our signals a long distance, at a, at a high data rate. Some of the factors that impact upon them, what impacts upon data rate, bandwidth does. We saw last week our capacity equations, Nyquist and Shannon, and most of you attempted the quizzes, and we'll say a bit more about that after this lecture, but the capacity equations give us some relationship between bandwidth, B, and data rate, C, or capacity. So they take into account other factors, noise, uh, the number of signal levels we use, but they give a relationship between, given some bandwidth, this is the maximum capacity you can achieve. So bandwidth impacts upon data rate. Noise, transmission impairments, also impacts upon data rate. We saw with the Shannon capacity equation, if we increase the noise, the data rate will go down. So more impairments, the worse for our data rate, and the worse for the distance as well. Similar interfe interference is in fact one uh, transmission impairment. The more people that are talking in this class, the harder it is for an individual to hear what I'm saying. The more that other transmitters are sending, potentially causing interference, the worse it is for our signals. And in some cases, the number of receivers when we're using a particular transmission media has, has an impact.
We'll see some examples of them. So when people design the transmission media and the signals to send across them, they take into account these factors and others, cost especially, and with the general aim of trying to send the data as fast as possible across a reasonable distance. We've said so far that, okay, we send our data as signals, some electromagnetic signal, and that those signals have some bandwidth, and have, which means that they have a range of frequencies at which the signals contain usually centred around some frequency. This is the spectrum that we have available for the signals that we can send. And first explaining what it shows on the top axis we have frequency in Hertz in a logarithmic scale so it's ranging from here 10 Hertz, 100 Hertz 10 to the power of 2, 1000 Hertz 10 to the power of 6, 1 megahertz, gigahertz, terahertz, petahertz. So we get up to the spectrum where we're talking about visible light. So light is some signal and the frequency range of visible light is up in this top, top end here of the spectrum. So and we, and we have some different examples of real life systems and, and communication media and the spectrum that they occupy. For example, telephone lines transmit signals ranging from the low hertz up to several kilohertz. Here we have 10,000 kilohertz, 10 to the power of 4 hertz, the telephone line. AM radio in this portion of the spectrum, an FM radio, 10 to the power of 8 is what? Is 100 million. What's your favourite radio channel? FM radio. What's your favourite FM radio? Choose a channel. 97.5 what? 97.5 is the, the frequency band that that radio channel is transmitted at. 97.5 megahertz. About 100 megahertz. You know, you have 105, 97, they're all around 100 megahertz, those radio channels which is 10 to the power of 8 on here. So FM radio is typically transmitted with signals in this frequency range. And of course they transmit on different channels or different bands. You have one radio channel and another radio channel they transmit with different frequencies 97.5 and 98.3 and so on. So that they don't interfere with each other. Many seats available. So some examples of uh, real applications of uh, using the spectrum. So this is basically the spectrum we have available for all of our signals. The problem that we have is if two transmitters transmit at the same time using the same frequencies, they will interfere with each other unless we have some way to stop that interference. It's the same as when two people talk in here, then the one person will receive the signals from both of those people and they'll be confused. They will not be able to understand what's being communicated. So we have a limited range of frequencies. So that's why we said last week and the week before that the larger the bandwidth we use, the higher the cost involved. Because we have a limited range, many people want to use this resource. Therefore, the more you use, the more you pay, effectively. And in fact, how it works is that governments allocate frequencies for different applications and different users. So to transmit FM radio, you need a license. That a li license allows you to transmit at some bandwidth at some specific frequency range, for example 97.5 megahertz. The signals that we talk about in practice, although we saw, draw the, drew them as sine waves and so on, 
and we drew them in the spectrum as things like this. That is, we see some of the examples where we have these impulses to represent the signal in the frequency domain. In practice, what we normally view a signal as is this is the frequency, this is the, the peak amplitude. The signal has most of its signal strength in some range of frequencies here. And that represents our bandwidth of the signal. And it's usually centered about some frequency. The center frequency, FC, for example. So when I say the radio, FM radio channel, what was it, 97.5 megahertz, that actually refers to the center frequency of that channel. Okay? So the signal for that FM radio channel is centered at around 97.5 megahertz and has some shape, it's, it's not very accurate, but, and has some bandwidth. And I cannot remember the bandwidth, uh, it's, it differs, I think, 20 kilohertz in some cases. That is, the frequency components of this FM radio channel range from, or from 97.5 megahertz plus or minus 10 kilohertz from, uh, what's that, 97.49 up to 97.51. As an example, we have a bandwidth, the range of frequencies, and we normally talk about a center frequency. And another radio channel, another one, anyone else have a favorite radio channel? Think of one. FM radio? Someone? 105.5, so if we view that, somewhere here, 105.5 megahertz, that's the center frequency for that channel. And similar, has some bandwidth, normally the same as the other channel. So two radio channels, this is the signals representing those two channels. So when 97.5 channel transmits, it transmits a signal centered around 97.5 megahertz with a bandwidth of, for example, 20 kilohertz. And the other FM channel transmits same bandwidth, but a different portion of the spectrum. And the channels are allocated such that they do not interfere with each other. That is, your receiver, your tuner, in your car or at home, you tune in to receive a particular channel. You tune in to receive frequencies in this range or in this range. They're both being transmitted at the same time. But because they're using a different range of the spectrum, they do not interfere with each other. So in fact, we divide the spectrum. So this is the entire spectrum we have available. This is a, a, a close-up viewpoint for two radio channels. We divide it into different applications and, for example, allocate licenses to different users. A license for one company to transmit in this portion of the spectrum and another company to transmit in 105.5. If the problem would arise if another transmitter transmitted, I'll use a different color, if another transmitter, another, say, a pirate radio station, someone started up a radio station, put up a transmitter, they didn't have a license, and if they transmit a signal, same bandwidth, around 20 kilohertz, but overlapping with a signal of 97.5, then the receiver, your receiver, would receive both of them. We see that there's some portions of the signal overlap. We get interference. Your receiver will not be able to understand either of those transmissions. 
that's a problem. That's why we need to allocate the spectrum using some rules, usually controlled by a government, for example, or an international organisation and governments. What we see on the screen is the entire spectrum we have available. FM radio is in just in this portion, but there are other example applications. Satellite TV, for example. Satellites transmit a signal, again, different channels, and your satellite receiver can receive a range of uh, frequency signals. Optical fibre. We'll see shortly optical fibre. We send light through some glass or plastic fibres and that represents our data. Infrared for your remote control or the, the laser pointer. Uh, microwave used for communications and also for, for cooking food and some other examples. There are many others as well. What we're going to do this morning is talk about three example wired or guided media. Twisted pair coaxial cable and optical fibre. There are others, but they are the three main ones we're going to cover. Where twisted pair is used inside these LAN cables and used in your home telephone line. We'll explain them. Transmits signals up from hertz up to 100 megahertz, 10 to the power of 8. That's the bandwidth of the signals transmitted in those twisted pair cables coaxial cable up to about 1 gigahertz. Coaxial cable can transmit signals at a higher bandwidth. You see, this is a maximum of 100 megahertz. This is a maximum of 1,000 megahertz. Ten times as large. Okay? The bandwidth for coaxial cable is higher than twisted pair. It may look confusing on this diagram, but remember it's a logarithmic scale. Even though this line is longer than this, because it's a logarithmic scale, in fact, this is much higher, or about 10 times higher than this point. And similar optical fibre, this is a very short line, but if you look at the values, the bandwidth of optical fibre is much larger than the other two. 10 to the power of 15 minus 10 to the power of 14. So 10 to the power of 15 is uh, 1 million gigahertz. So much larger, 1 million gigahertz, much larger than here just 1 gigahertz, and here it's 0 0.1 gigahertz. So optical fiber can transmit signals at a much larger bandwidth, giving us a much larger data rate. Let's look at those three example transmission media. So we look, look at three examples for guided media, wired media. With electrical cables, whether it's coaxial cable, twisted pair, the idea is that we transmit some electrical signal through some conducting material. Copper is a good example of a conducting material. It conducts electricity very well, so the signal flows very well through it, and uh, reasonably cheap compared to some other alternatives. So copper is very common, but it doesn't have to be copper. When we transmit some electri electrical signal across some copper wire, then that cable radiates energy out. Okay, the energy passes through the copper wire, but energy disperses from the cable as well. And also, that cable can pick up energy from other sources. So if we're transmitting some electrical signal across a copper wire, nearby sources can receive that signal as well, and other nearby transmitters can interfere with our copper wire and the signal on the wire. That's a problem. That is. Sending a signal across one wire can cause interference with neighbouring wires, nearby wires. And interference is bad because our receiver cannot understand what is being received. The same as here. If we transmit signals at the same frequency range, the receiver will receive both sets of signals and cannot make sense of what data was transmitted because 
they interfere with each other. Interference results in poor quality receiver, uh, signals at the receiver and therefore results in more bit errors or more errors at the receiver and worse for our system. So we want to avoid this or we want to minimize interference. Some practical ways in which we can minimize interference is to keep the cable length short. It turns out the shorter the cable is the less chance of interference from other sources. Having a half or one meter cable as opposed to a 100 meter cable, the interference and the effects of the interference on the shorter cable are much smaller than the longer cable. But remember we said before we want to cover a long distance. It's no good if I need to connect this computer to a computer downstairs via many one meter cables. I'd like to use one long cable. So keeping cables short is a way to minimize interference, but generally we'd like to be able to transmit as long as possible, long distance. Keep cables away from other sources. If I connect this computer, and it has a cable in it, down to some device downstairs on the third floor via one cable, to avoid interference on that cable, one way is to make sure that there are no other electrical sources nearby. No other cables nearby, no other uh, electrical power outlets and transmissions of electricity nearby that cable. That's one way to minimize interference. But that's hard to do because, for example, in buildings, often we need to run many cables and convenient to have them in the same location. Power, network cables, uh, audio cables and so on. So it's sometimes hard to keep away keep our cables away from other sources. The other thing, and that's what we'll look at, is design the cables so that even if they're near other sources, interference will not be so large. That is, they will not pick up energy from other transmitters. Design the cables so that the interference is not large by giving them some shielding. So adding some materials or some coating around the copper wires such that when they transmit, they do not transmit and uh, disperse the energy too much and they do not pick up from other sources which are transmitting. So give some shielding to the cables. And or organize the wires so that they don't interfere with each other. We'll see some examples of how to do that in the three that we go through. So now we're going to look at just three quick examples of guided media. First is twisted pair. You can pass some of these around. You've seen the cables before. But you've seen these cables many times. I'm sure you've used them we've shown you before. You. The short ones, sorry, the short ones are just a cut of those LAN cables. The short ones which are cut, you can see the inside, you see that there are four, pa four pairs of wires inside. So those LAN cables in fact contain four pairs of copper wires. And you'll see when they come around to you that they're twisted around each other. So we have a pair of copper conductors twisted around each other. Sort of shown like this. The black and the green twisted around each other. Why? Well, the way that they twist around each other means that they do not interfere. It reduces the picking up of sources from uh, el elsewhere and radiating the energy to other sources. So it's a way to reduce interference. Twisting them around each other reduces the interference between the different pairs and from other sources. So that's where we get twisted pair. Normally the conductors are copper wires. So we have two insulated copper wires arranged in this spiral pattern. In the ones I'm passing around there are four twisted pairs. 
it's commonly or it's the most commonly used guided transmission media today and the least expensive of the three that we're going to talk about. It's very cheap. Buying a cable is uh, in the terms of tens of baht. So it's very cheap to buy, to manufacture. Uh, very common. Used in telephone networks. Your home telephone line probably uses twisted pair. And of course used in LANs connecting your computer to a local area network, you commonly use the cables that I'm passing around. It can support signals, analog signals, like your telephone line, and also used for digital signaling. That is, you can send digital signals across these cables. So it's convenient to support both types of signaling. So in the examples that we're passing around, four twisted pairs, inside each of those pairs, or each of those is a copper wire. You can see the endpoints. There's a copper wire, there's some insulator outside that copper wire, and then we get a pair of them and we twist, twist them around each other, and we send our signal across that pair. That is, we transmit electricity on both of those copper wires in the one direction. And it's the signals are designed to such that it's easy for the receiver to receive and decode the data that was communicated. In the LAN cables we're passing around, when you connect, say, your laptop into some switch or some home ADSL router via one of those LAN cables, there are four pairs in there. Normally, one pair is used for transmitting in one direction and another pair in the opposite direction. Hence, we get full duplex communications. We use one pair for one and another for the opposite direction. We have two spare pairs. When you're using 100 megabit per second ethernet, you only use two of those twisted pairs. When you use one gigabit per second ethernet, it uses all four of those pairs. So it dif differs depending upon the capabilities of your transmitting device, your, your LAN card or your built-in uh, land car. The shielding around those pairs, you see the cables, there's shielding around the individual wires, and then there's that white shielding around all the pairs, designed to protect from interference. For twisted pair, there are generally different types, and the basic is that we have shielded twisted pair, STP, and unshielded twisted pair. What you have in front of you is, in fact, unshielded twisted pair, UTP. Shielded twisted pair has some extra shielding around them, much stronger, much more rigid shielding around it. And the difference in terms of performance is with shielded twisted pair, much less interference, and we can send at higher data rates. We can send faster. The practical problem with shielded, with shielded twisted pair is that it doesn't bend very well. These cables, you can just bend them in any direction. With shielded twisted pair, the shielding is much harder, so you cannot bend them easily, and it makes it much harder to install, to feed the wires through walls, up through the cavities and so on. If you cannot bend the cable, it will not work very well. So in practice, unshielded twisted pair is the most common, and what you see in front of you is the unshielded twisted pair cable. The shielded ones have much more shielding, that is, much more protection from interference. There are also multiple categories that it's, the technology has been improved over time. The ones that you see, I think, may be category five, that is, category six and so on, and, and lower ones. So that's just one example of a, the most common transmission media for wired transmission that uh, we'll go through. Another example, 
coaxial cable. We have, again, some conducting material, but we have two conductors, one inside another. This shows some cross-section of if you cut a co coaxial cable. There's one conducting material in the middle. There's some insulation around it. And then the green one here is the outer conductor, another conducting material. And then some outer insulation or shielding around that. The idea here, again, is protect from interference from other sources. Twisted pair, the way we arrange them, protects from interference. Similar, having one conductor inside another also protects from interference. So the design is to protect from interference and cause less interference on others. Just by arranging the conductors when we transmit electricity across them. Compared to twisted pair, so if we compare them now, coaxial cable provides more shielding. So the, the insulation, the way that we arrange the conductors and the shielding on the outside is much better than twisted pair. With more shielding, what that means is when we transmit our signal, there'll be less interference to other sources and less interference from other sources on our signal. The end result is with more shielding, we can send faster. The more shielding we have, the less interference and the higher the data rate we can achieve. So generally with twisted pair compared to coaxial cable, we can get higher data rates or send uh, yeah, higher data rates on coaxial cable compared to twisted pair. You've seen coaxial cables, I don't have an example, for audio applications, connecting hi fis sometimes, connecting the cable into your TV from the antenna, from satellite TV antenna, the satellite antenna down to your TV, commonly uses coaxial cable. That's an example. So cable TV uh, is a common example. Compared to twisted pair, higher data rates, longer distances because it's got more shielding, more protection from interference. We can send a signal across a longer distance without being affected at the receiver. It's been used in long distance telecommunications, for example, connecting one city to another. In the past it was used, but mainly today it's been replaced by optical fiber in that case. In most cases for connecting cities together, optical fiber is used and countries as well. In the past, coaxial cable was used. So two examples, twisted pair, coaxial cable. And the last example, we go through quickly, we're just mentioning the technologies, not going to explain how they work. Optical fiber. Here we don't send electricity, what we do is send light. We have some glass or plastic fibre, some very thin piece of glass, for example, or plastic. And there's a light source at one endpoint, and the light, as an example, flows through the fibre and is received at the other endpoint. So now we're using, sending very high frequency signals, light in this case, through some glass or plastic fibre. And in fact, inside one cable, we may have many fibres, many individual, very thin fibres of glass or plastic. Commonly used now in long distance communications between cities, between countries, and of also more so inside smaller networks, sometimes in some lands where you need very fast connections, optical fibre can be used. Connecting offices across a city is another example. What's the advantage of optical fibre versus electrical cables, the previous two, coaxial cable and twisted pair? The energy is not lost as much. That is, as the attenuation is much lower. Remember, when we send our signal, it gets weaker across distance. It depends upon different factors. Generally, when we send our signal through optical fibre, it can travel much further with the same amount of loss as the electrical signal across the previous two cases. So we can transfer our signals across much larger distances with a single cable. If you look back to the spectrum slide, we see that the 
bandwidth available for optical fiber is much larger than the others. Larger bandwidth, larger potential data rate. We can send much faster. Sometimes a single fiber can be the same as tens or even hundreds of electrical cables. So if you want to send a lot of data from one city to another, rather than having hundreds of coaxial cables, just have one optical fiber that connects. Saves in space, saves in weight, and makes things cheaper. Small size, lightweight, lower cost to install. And they are not impacted by other electrical sources. We're sending light signals. If there's a nearby electrical source, there would be no interference from that source. Whereas with the other two cases, coaxial cable and twisted pair, if there's a neighbouring electrical source, that it can cause interference on our signal. Not so in optical fibres. Transmit larger distances, larger data rate. For large data rates, lower cost of installation. But if we only have a small amount of data to send, for example, from this computer downstairs, we don't need a very high data rate, then the cost of using optical fiber is very high. So that's the disadvantage. And they're summarized here, or some of the characteristics are summarized. The electrical cables, twisted pair and coaxial cable, are two examples. Moderate data rates, okay, in the order of one gigabit per second, less than in some cases, or slightly more in other cases. Distance for twisted pair, usually maximum of two kilometers. Coaxial cable, 10 kilometers. Most applications, much shorter. Inside a LAN, usually the maximum distance is in terms of 100 meters or, or slightly more. But you can get shielded twisted pair, which will go much further. They are the cheapest for low data rates. When you only want to send one gigabit per second, then cheaper than using optical fiber. With unshielded twisted pair, it's easy to install, but we can get interference. That's a bad thing. But easy to install means that anyone can install it. Shielded twisted pair and coaxial cable doesn't bend so well, harder to install, but provides more protection from interference. We can send faster compared to unshielded twisted pair. When we move to optical cables or optical fiber, data rates greater than 100 gigabits per second. So now if we want to send a lot of data from source to destination, optical, fi optical fiber becomes cheaper than the other options if we've got very high data rates. Okay. The, our option is to use one optical fiber from Bangkok to Chiang Mai or use tens or hundreds of electrical cables. And using many cables means it's harder to install, use more space, more weight, and generally higher cost. So optical fiber becomes better as we need higher data rates. We can transmit up to about 40 kilometers across a single optical fiber. That's good. You want to send signals from Hong Kong to LA in California, across or under the Pacific Ocean. So you have what's called submarine cables, cables under at the bottom of the ocean. And because it's, what, thousands of kilometers, that they need to transmit, what they do is they have a cable and then they have a repeater or amplifier that sends the signal again across the next cable under at the bottom of the ocean. So having a large distance for each individual cable is very useful in that case. So using optical fiber under the ocean is much better than using the shorter distance uh, electrical cables. The equipment is expensive and harder to install so it only becomes cost effective when we need very high data rates. What is hard about optical fibers, have we got an example? Where are those short cut pieces? Is there a, here's one. 
So we've cut, we'll just basically you take one of these. If you cut one in half, you can look here. You can take two of these and join them together. You just need to wrap them around and you can cut this in half. You can add your own endpoints quite easily. You can join cables together. It's quite easy for anyone to uh, make these cables. With an optical fiber, if you cut the optical fiber, you need special expensive equipment to join them together and to fix things. Not anyone can do it. So unshielded twisted pair, very easy to install and use. Optical fiber, very difficult to install. Costs more for the people to do it and the equipment to, to use it. And that's all we want to say about those three example guided media. So what you want to pick up is be able to compare them. Know about these three. Be able to compare them in, OK, one is faster than the other. You don't need to remember the exact data rates and the exact frequencies. Some of these slides give some more technical details, like the bandwidth or frequency range, from megahertz up to terahertz and the delay and other characteristics, and some plots about that information. You don't need to remember this information. Just be able to compare those three against each other. Understand the trade-offs in terms of data rate, bandwidth, easy to install, uh, distance, uh, some important trade-offs. Any questions about those three guided media? Three examples. You need your handout so you can follow along. We've got a full class today, so uh, any talking makes it hard for everyone else. Any questions? We're not going to go through any more details about those three. Uh, you need to be able to, for example, given some requirements, if I want to transmit uh, 100 megabits per second inside my home, which one do I use? Twisted pair, coaxial cable, or optical fiber? Twisted pair is normally considered. Why? Because it's easy to install, it's cheap, it can support that data rate of 100 megabits per second. So compared to the others which are harder to install, more expensive, it's the more appropriate one. If you want to send 100 gigabits per second of data from one city to another, optical fiber is better. So it's a comparison between those technologies. There are three examples of guided media wired media. The rest of this topic is about wireless transmission and wi wireless media or unguided media. Go back to the original spectrum slide that we had. What's the maximum bandwidth for optical fiber? Can anyone calculate it? The maximum bandwidth from this diagram of twisted pair, coaxial cable, and optical fiber. Those three examples we just, gone, we just went through. The maximum bandwidth. One million gigahertz. Approximately, one way we calculate if we, we see optical fiber can transmit signals in this frequency range from around 10 to the power of 14 hertz up to 10 to the power of 15 hertz, which is a bandwidth of 10 to the power of 15 minus 10 to the power of 14, which is it's very close to 10 to the power of 15. It's one, one million megahertz 
minus 100,000 megahertz. So it's 900,000 megahertz or 900 gigahertz. for optical fiber and we see for example for coaxial ca cable it's around 1 gigahertz and in fact only goes down to 1 kilohertz but it's close to zero so the bandwidth is for coaxial cable is approximately 1 gigahertz whereas for optical fiber approximately 900 gigahertz much higher bandwidth available can send much faster so that's relating some of the things we said to the spectrum chart. Similar applies for wireless transmission. FM radio, satellite transmission, example of unguided media, wireless transmission. The more bandwidth we have available, the faster we can send. The problem with unguided media is that our signals are not controlled. With guided media, our wires, because we use shielding and some insulation, in fact if I have this cable here and a second cable nearby, if it's one or two meters away, they're not going to interfere because even if we're using transmitting signals at the same frequency range, the energy from this cable is not going to propagate to that one. It's, it's too weak to interfere with another one. So by separating them by some distance, I can transmit a signal along, along this cable using the frequency range for our twisted pair up to 100 megahertz and at the same time transmit another signal using the same frequency range across this second cable. And if we separate them far enough they will not interfere with each other. But the problem with unguided media is that they, we have no insulation and no uh, guiding of the signals. Normally when we transmit wireless say from my laptop to the access point, the signal propagates everywhere. I transmit the signal from my laptop, it goes in this direction, this direction, that direction to the access point, it goes up and up and down, it goes all around. So the problem now is that it can potentially interfere with other signals which are transmitting in the same frequency range. So there's much more chance for interference with unguided media. So it becomes more complex in how to control what frequency channels they use and make sure that one transmitter doesn't interfere with another transmitter. So there's much more complexity involved with wireless transmission to making sure we get high data rates. Let's look at the basics of wireless transmission. Before we go through examples of media, and we may not get through them today, we'll go through some uh, basic model of how we transmit a signal wirelessly via wireless or unguided media. Some example systems that we'll eventually go through are, for example, television transmission from a, a TV station wirelessly to the antennas you have on your TV, referred to as terrestrial microwave. Microwave refers to the frequency range. Actually, I didn't explain it. Go back to the spectrum. We see here some abbreviations. They are some common names for parts of the spectrum. Anyone know what they mean? F, as a hint, F means frequency. High frequency, HF, very high frequency, VHF, ultra high frequency, super high frequency, I can't remember, extremely high frequency, not very intelligent names, but talking about the frequency in that band for relative to some other point. Very low frequency, low frequency, very low frequency, extremely low frequency, I guess. Okay, so some have common names. So we talk about different bands. This is the frequency and this is the corresponding wavelength. VF, 
There's your homework for today. Find out what VF is. I can't remember. This is the frequency. They have some common names, but not all of them. We just talk about here as light, the light frequencies. And the infrared range of frequencies here. So they don't use the common names, but we generally refer to infrared regarding the color of light. And here we often refer to these as microwave frequencies. Why microwave? Here's the wavelength. The wavelength is in the order of micrometers. So we have frequency, wavelength, uh, and some portions of the spectrum are given names that we commonly hear when we've, people refer to them. Go back to our wireless. So some examples that you know of, TV transmission, satellite internet. IP Star will go through as an example as a common satellite internet provider in Asia. Uh, Wi-Fi, wireless LAN, uses different range of frequencies, sometimes called as broadcast radio. And infrared, the infrared control, your TV remote control. They use different range of frequencies. And importantly, our signal propagating at different frequencies has different characteristics. A simple model when we send a wireless signal, we can think we have some transmitting device that wants to send the data to a receiver. And what we do is we have some electricity and it goes into an antenna which generates the electromagnetic waves to send, to propagate through the air. Okay? And our signal propagates from the transmit antenna and is picked up by a receive antenna, which converts it back to some electrical signal which is received. So we need to know something about the antennas. Has anyone got an iPhone? Where's your antenna? where you put your hand when you talk. That's the problem. So with your phone, the antennas are built in there in different shapes. You do not see them, but they're built into the back of the, or in the side of the uh, uh, phone. In your laptop, sometimes the antenna is, say, in the back of the screen. And we see in the access point, there are two antennas on this case. And the other common antennas you see are these dish-shaped antennas that you see on a roof for satellite transmission and so on. So there are different types of antennas. We'll talk about those types of antennas because they impact upon uh, the signals that are transmitted and received. What an antenna does is converts some electrical current into an electromagnetic wave. So some current comes into the antenna, it creates some waveform that comes out, that's propagated through the air. And it's the opposite at the receive antenna. The waves typically range in frequencies from around 3 kilohertz up to 300 gigahertz for wireless transmission. referred to as sometimes generally just the radio frequency band, the RF band, as a common name. The characteristics of a transmit antenna and a receive antenna are the same. That is, uh, we just talk about generally the characteristics the same as whether it's sending or receiving. So we generate some wave, electromagnetic wave that comes out of the antenna the direction which, in which that wave goes and how far it propagates depends upon the antenna shape, the, the design of the antenna. And we'll talk about uh, three general shapes or designs of antennas. There are others as well. An isotropic antenna is an antenna that propagates a signal in all directions with equal strength. So an isotropic antenna, if I was generating a, a signal which went forward when I talk at the same strength as going backwards 
and all to the sides and up and down, you can think there'll be a sphere around me where at some point on that sphere, the received signal will be the same strength at all the points in the sphere. That is, the signal propagates in all directions around the, the transmitter in equal strength. That's what we call our ideal antenna and we'll refer to that as a baseline as an antenna. We cannot build these isotropic antennas. There are some physical limitations but we'll refer to them uh, shortly. I cannot draw it very easily but we can draw it in two dimensions. Here's my antenna. The, I'm going to draw it in two dimensions, but you need to think of it in three dimensions. But here's my antenna. It transmits some signal. And we can think that that signal propagates in all directions. And in all directions. So the signal propagates out in all directions from the transmitter. The point is, if this was a circle close to, if the distance from the transmitter to the receiver in this case was one meter, and so this is a circle one meter from the center point, the transmitter. So the, all these arrows are one meter in length then if this is an isotropic antenna we transmit our signal with some power if we have a receiver one meter away at this point we receive with some power say PR at point one the power received at point one and at another point one meter away we'd receive with some other power level PR at point two point one and at point two and they are the same. That is at any point one, one meter away from the transmitter the received power level will be the same. The energy disperses in all directions at the same rate. Therefore we transmit with some power and we receive with some power in a sphere around the transmitter at the equal power. I am not an isotropic antenna. When I talk, if I turn off the microphone, it's, my signal is stronger in this direction because my voice propagates in this direction, but weaker behind me. My voice does not propagate as strong in the opposite direction. So I am not an isotropic antenna. In fact, all the antennas that we design for our communication systems, some may be close to, but they're not uh, the ideal isotropic antennas. Of course, this is in two dimensions. In reality, it's three dimensions. It's out and in as well. Any point one meter away from the transmitter will receive the power at the same strength. That's our isotropic antenna. Another type of antenna we commonly see and here referred to is an omnidirectional antenna. These antennas here are close to omnidirectional antennas. The power propagates in one direction in all directions on one plane. So if here's our antenna, the power propagates in this direction at the same rate as in this direction, this direction, and this direction on the, this one horizontal plane. But going up, the power does not propagate so far and going down. So sometimes if you visualize that, it becomes sort of some donut shape around some point. That is, the energy di disperses in that direction and that direction the same, but going up, it's much weaker and going down much weaker. We'll see some examples of them uh, shortly, some real ones. Omnidirectional, all, all directions, but in one plane. And that's what these are, and that's why if you turn them around, generally these signals propagate our energy stronger 
in this plane. So towards that direction, at the back, the signal will be stronger than, which is, let's say, 10 meters away, than if you go up 10 meters. If you go up 10 meters, the signal will be very weak. The signal propagates in one direction. And of course, 10 meters in this direction, it will be the same as 10 meters in that direction. So on the one horizontal plane, the signal is equal, but going up and down, it's much weaker. A directional antenna concentrates the power in a particular direction. So instead of sending the energy in all directions, concentrate it in one particular direction. So that most of the energy when you transmit goes in that direction, and very little of the energy dissipates in other directions. And that's what you get with those, commonly those dish-shaped antennas, where you need to point them even with your satellite home, uh, satellite TV, if you have a satellite dish at home, you need to point it at the satellite in the general direction of the satellite. If you point it the other way, you will not get reception. It's a directional antenna because it propagates the energy all in one direction. It doesn't dissipate all around. We're going to talk about the differences and how they impact upon the, the signal propagation shortly uh, and come up with antenna gain. But let's, before we do that, let's go forward to one important thing. Maybe I should have said before, again, we have signals at different ranges of the spectrum. We saw our spectrum chart before and our wireless signals typically range from, well here we've got from, well actually the entire spectrum from 30 hertz up to 900 terahertz, our optical fiber. And here's some of those common names and answer your question. Voice frequency, VF low frequency, extremely high frequency, and so on. Infrared and visible light. So not just wireless. Uh, other. And the range of frequencies, the wavelengths. The point here is that the frequency has some impact upon how that signal propagates, and especially through different materials. Does my infrared pointer go through the wall? If you're on the other side of this wall, would you see the green light? No. Does your mobile phone transmission go through the wall? Yes. Why? It's to do with the frequency. They're using different frequencies. And the frequencies, the frequencies have different char characteristics in the propagation. And what stops them propagating? And some of those examples are given here. Um, infrared, well, actually it doesn't say too much. Some signals are blocked by different obstacles. For example, concrete, wood will block my infrared signal. Some signals are blocked by water, or the w water will make the signal weaker. Sometimes with satellite TV or terrestrial microwave TV, if it's raining, the signal can get much worse, the reception much worse on the TV. That's because the signal, as it's going through the rain, is being uh, not blocked, but is getting weaker because it doesn't pass through water so well. That depends upon the frequency of the signal. So an important point is that different signals have different characteristics in terms of how they propagate and what they propagate through, what obstacles they'll pass through. Some of that information is listed here. We'll, uh, different signals propagate through uh, the atmosphere differently, cosmic noise, uh, rain, and so on. So when we choose a frequency to use in our communication sy system, we need to consider our requirements. Do we need communications through walls? If so, infrared is not an appropriate solution. We need to use a different frequency range. Let's go.
go back to our antennas. On this website, there's some information and some examples about antennas. Cisco is a company that makes networking equipment, including wireless and wireless LAN equipment specifically. And on their website, they have many details about the equipment. I'll just show you some quick examples from that website of antennas. In fact, their antenna and their reference guide is a very good description of how antennas and wireless transmission works. It's a, it's a long document, we won't go through now, but explains the background of radio, of antennas, and different frequencies. But the useful thing here, mainly related to um, wireless LAN, you cannot read it, but you'll recognise some of the pictures. This is a picture like mine on the board of the omnidirectional antenna. The signal goes equally in all directions around the transmitter. Of course, we cannot see it in two dimensions. Whereas a directional antenna, this figure three here, uh, figure two it is, the directional antenna of a particular type, we can see the signal is stronger in this direction and weaker on the side directions. So the signal, the energy is concentrated in one direction. That's a directional antenna. And there are different types of directional antennas. This is an example for what's called a patch antenna, like a square or a rectangle uh, that you may see on, on the wall or on the roof for some wireless LAN access points. And some other directional antennas. They concentrate the energy in one particular direction. The energy is strong in this direction, but very weak behind it in other directions. Gives some discussion of how signals propagate, but the thing we want to go through uh, it's way down the bottom. Then they they list some of their products. Cisco makes antennas, so they list the products here and the, the shape or the antenna type. A dipole is like these ones on the access point. Like a, uh, omnidirectional, different shaped antennas. We'll see later that a gain is one parameter of the antenna. We'll see shortly. So different shaped typed antennas that they have available to buy. and eventually we'll get there. Another shape you know about is a dish antenna, one of those parabolic dish antennas. Somewhere here. Then they give characteristics of each of the antennas. For example, here's one of their antennas, like the one on the access point. And they give the characteristics in terms of how the energy radiates or propagates from the perspective of two different planes, or the horizontal and the vertical plane. So in this antenna, if you can think of going around the antenna, the signal propagates equally in all directions. But up and down, it differs. You, you cannot see on this screen, you have to zoom in, but you see that uh, going up and down, the signal will be weaker with this type of antenna. So there are these types of diagrams that describe how the energy propagates from real antennas. And they talk about the frequency range which it's used for, and especially the gain. And there are others. Uh, I don't know if there's, see, here's, sorry, different type of antenna, and the propagation characteristics of this antenna differ from the, the dipole that they had before. So depending on where you want to send your signal, you choose an antenna that uh, will propagate the signal in the correct direction. That's useful to look through maybe uh, 
in your assignment, which we'll talk about later. The last thing to finish on, and we saw some numbers there, is the antenna gain. We think that an isotropic antenna is the ideal antenna where the signal propagates in all directions equally. That means if you measure the received signal strength one meter away, any, in any direction from our isotropic antenna, we'll get the same received signal strength. With a directional antenna, if we can draw it in just a single plane, here's our directional antenna. One meter away at this point, the received signal may be strong if the antenna is propagating the, or concentrating the energy in this direction. But in this direction, one meter away, the received signal may be weak. Because the directional antenna concentrates the energy in one direction. So you can think in the other directions, the signal is not as strong. The antenna gain is a characteristic of real antennas, which talks about how much stronger the antenna or the received signal strength is compared to an isotropic antenna. If we measured this received signal here to be at a level of one watt. We'll talk about watts later, but if the received signal strength for an isotropic antenna one meter away is one watt, and for our directional antenna, because we concentrate the energy in one direction, this direction, one meter away the received signal strength will be stronger than one watt, for example, two watts. If for this antenna the received signal strength is two watts, it's twice as strong as it would be if we use an isotropic antenna. Of course, in the opposite direction, it could be very weak. A directional antenna concentrates the energy in one direction, but it's very weak in the other direction. So it's strong here, one meter away, two watts, very weak in the opposite direction at, say, 0 0.01 watts. We talk about the gain of this antenna relative to an isotropic antenna. We have two watts is the strongest. With an isotropic, we'd get just one watt, so we have a gain of two. That is, compared to an isotropic antenna, the gain of our directional antenna, our real one, in this direction, is two. Twice as strong as isotropic. Now we convert that into a logarithm. 10 log 2. And what do we get? Log of 2. Calculator. Calculator, log 0 0.3 times by 10. Log of 2 is 0 0.3 times 10. We get approximately 3 dB. So we talk about an antenna gain of a real antenna relative to the ideal isotropic antenna. In this case, if we measured the received signal strength one meter away and it was two watts, if we used an isotropic antenna and the received signal strength was one watt, we say the gain is two, twice as strong. Convert it to decibels, it's three dB, and the notation we use is three decibels relative to an isotropic antenna. You get dBi. The lowercase i means isotropic. And that's a common measure of antennas. When you buy an antenna, you want to know how much gain it introduces into the system. And that gain is measured in dBi, decibels relative to an isotropic antenna. If you buy this directional antenna, one characteristic, it would say that the maximum gain is 3 dBi. You know that the signal strength 
at some point is twice as strong as if you use an isotropic antenna at the same distance away from the transmitter. Of course, it's weaker in the other direction, but we don't care about that because we're not going to point the antenna in that direction. We're going to uh, we use it just to transmit in one direction. So antenna gain is an important characteristic for antennas. So relative to an isotropic antenna, a perfect antenna, we talk about a real antenna's gain is how much stronger is the signal strength at the same point if, as if we used an isotropic antenna. If one meter away from me you hear my voice at some level of 10, if you used an isotropic antenna, if I dispersed my energy equally in all directions, and you heard the signal at a magnitude of 5 with an isotropic antenna, then I have introduced a gain of 2. That is, normally when I transmit, it's, two, it's 10. With an isotropic, it's 5. That is, it's 2 times as strong. So by concentrating our energy in one direction, we get more strength in that direction, but weaker in the other, other direction. And we measure that increase compared to an isotropic antenna in dBi decibels relative to isotropic. So an isotropic antenna is used for theory, for, for designing real antennas and, and comparing real antennas. And back to this website, you'll see the gain is listed as a characteristic of the antenna, 5 dBi for this one. Another antenna, this one's 5.2 dBi. Uh, if we go down, 6 dBi, 8.5 dBi. So different shaped antennas, different size antennas will impact upon the gain of that antenna. Larger the gain, we'll see short, or we'll see next week, the further we can send the signal, the larger distance. We're out of time for now. Let's have a break. Uh, so at 10.40, what we'll do is stop this topic. We may answer some questions about the topic uh, after the break, but what I've got is uh, a quiz for you to do with four questions. So I've got the handout and you'll do the, some of those questions in this class and then we'll discuss some of the answers. So after at 10.40 through to 12, we'll just do some practice questions from all the previous topics.